right, that is noon by my clock. Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, our community meetup on racism and oppression. Um, if you are in this room, then I consider you part of our community um, for the sake of this conversation, uh, and we're really happy that you joined us. Um, I need to acknowledge the intensity of the moment we find ourselves in. Uh, we were already living in a global pandemic, um, and the trauma from that was profound already, um, and now recent murders of black folks, uh, many at the hands of police, have really intensified that, and ensuing um, protests have, uh, have brought some, some joy, some, um, some hope, but also some despair and some outrage, and so we're feeling a lot of feelings, and so we want to hold a space for us to, to talk about those today. Uh, there are a few things I need to tell you logistically before we get started. Um, we're calling this a, a meetup, which is meant to convey uh, an interactive discussion. And so you see the chat box uh, below, um, kind of in the middle of the screen, the bottom of the screen. Um, and I, we encourage you all to introduce yourselves as you're joining in and uh, tell us where you're from. Um, and that's the, the space that we'll use to, um, to talk with one another primarily. Um, we're also going to experiment with uh, using the audio. So if you notice at the top of your screen, there is an icon that looks like somebody raising their hand. Uh, at certain points during the uh, presentation today, we will encourage you, if you feel comfortable, uh, to raise your hand, and then we'll enable your microphone through your computer, uh, and then you can talk uh, using your voice. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable with that, please feel free just to, to use the chat. Um, let's see, if you have technical difficulties, you can also use the chat box for that, um, or you can call Caroline at the number 615-200-6165, um, and then she can help you out. And I'm so glad to see everybody introducing themselves. So here are our goals for the hour. I'm sure this hour will go by really fast, so we'll try to, to move along at a nice clip. Um, but we're going to start by defining some terms and some norms, um, because conversations about racism are inherently tricky. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, we're going to have four basic sections where we will have uh, some poll questions to kind of stimulate dialogue. And then we just encourage uh, you all to share in the chat how you're feeling and, and responding to these different buckets. So talking about how we're feeling is the first one. Then we'll talk about how. Uh, Structural racism in the moment we find ourselves particularly affects um, uh, people experiencing homelessness. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, how this affects the providers um, in this movement. And then we'll probably just barely scratch the surface about what it might really mean to institutionalize anti-racism within our organizations. So I hope that sounds like a good plan for y'all. So um, I'm Michael Durham. I work for the council, and I'm based in Nashville. Um, and I'm, I'd like to ask LaJuan to, to go first in introducing herself. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be spending this time with all of you. Um, my name is LaWanda Williams, and I uh, work at Healthcare for the Homeless in Baltimore City. I am the director of housing services there. Um, it's really important um, that I say how grateful I am for these sorts of spaces. Um, as, as, as Michael has shared, um, we find ourselves in a very precarious time. Um, and while that is true, um, this is also a really unique opportunity to, I think, you know, address many of the inequities that we have found in our community and have certainly known existed in the lives of our clients. Um, and really have found ourselves at this sort of uh, metaphoric boiling point. Um, and so I think this is a great time to be engaging in these kinds of conversations and to really um, move the needle forward in terms of really coming up with ways in which we can turn our collective sorrow and mourning um, and rage in some instances um, into action. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be with you all this afternoon. Thank you, Luanda. David? Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, 
My name is David Peary. Um, I serve as a federal class representative in the um, Pottinger Federal Consent Decree. Um, essentially, the Pottinger Federal Consent Decree was the outgrowth of um, about a decade and a half of litigation against the um, city of Miami, Miami City Police. And it essentially dictates the way that police can approach people who are experiencing homelessness um, when they're seeking to um, interact with them um, when they're um, engaged in life-sustaining activities, such as sleeping on the streets or eating, sitting, things like that. And essentially, it simply says that the police cannot arrest um, individuals who are homeless for, for um, conducting life-sustaining activities um, that, are, that are associated with certain misdemeanors unless they first offer them shelter. So shelter needs to be available before you can arrest somebody, which seems to be a, you know, a, a common sense, in my opinion, um, requirement. It, it also um, requires the Miami City Police and the City of Miami to protect individuals' property. So I'm very happy to be talking today um, because uh, we're, we're going to address the um, effect of um, COVID and, and racism, basically, on um, criminalization of those activities and, um, and essentially um, how it's affecting people who are living on the streets right now. Um, because unfortunately, um, as we get to my portion of the um, seminar here, um, we'll see that um, the cities are using the um, COVID crisis pandemic as a pretext to um, criminalize um, homelessness. Thank you, David and Luanda. Really uh, honored that you have taken your time to facilitate this conversation. Um, I just want to very briefly go over some rules for engagement. As I mentioned, uh, conversations about racism can be tricky, but uh, for different reasons if you're a person of color or a white person. White people are not, uh, most of us are not raised to talk about race, um, and so we are uncomfortable. Um, people of color don't have that option uh, of not talking about race when they're children, um, but it can still be difficult because it can be really re-traumatizing. So, um, we just want to put a little bit of parameters around this conversation. Um, so just very briefly, take space, make space, uh, suggests that you should um, um, make space for others uh, in this conversation, uh, especially uh, as you're mindful of your own privilege uh, in this conversation, um, which is uh, what we're getting at in the second one there, too. Um, I don't believe that safe space is actually possible, but what, because uh, we cannot predict what any of us will say and how that will affect us, but we can strive to, to, to try to create a safe space or a brave space, uh, as some have put it. We want to respect personal experience. We want to assume positive intent while also acknowledging impact. Ouch is a, is a kind of a short way to say, hey, that hurt my feelings, and I just need to acknowledge that. Um, as we'll talk about in a second, we really need to focus on systems over individuals. Um, so really accusations of your racist are kind of missing the point in this conversation. Um, embrace ambiguity. People disagree on critical issues within this work, and that's okay, and that's sort of uh, inherent to uh, work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we're going to re welcome respectful disagreement. Uh, we'll try to call each other in instead of calling each other out. Um, and I really I want to emphasize the final two ones. Can, let's be present. Um, I really encourage you to uh, close Outlook, focus on this conversation, take a moment to breathe, and just be with us for the next 51 minutes. Um, and then respect confidentiality. Um, we don't want to just be blabbering about what other people have shared that is vulnerable in this space. I'm going to spend almost no time on this because we've already uh, addressed this a lot, but we're here because uh, the incessant killing and dehumanization of black people has reached a boiling point, which is uh, the phrase that Lawanda used. Um, and we want to spend some time about how this particularly affects the healthcare for the homeless community. Um, and structural racism, of course, uh, is especially traumatizing. Um, and especially when we see public lynchings on Twitter, uh, it can be really difficult for us to process. Um, and we do find ourselves in a moment where some of us believe that uh, we have a unique shot at actually making systemic change uh, compared to even three weeks ago. Um, 
So that's why we're here. I'm going to ask Lawanda to tell us a little bit of just setting the stage of uh, how we think about racism for the purposes of this conversation. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, so I, the way in which I sort of think about, and, and many scholars actually, um, I follow in their steps of, of thinking about racism with respect to three really core domains, and they're really interesting um, and important to sort of understand the, the differences between them. Um, because I think that oftentimes we think about, uh, when we think about racism and racist behavior, we often think about it existing within this, um, this binary sort of thing where, um, you know, racists are bad. And if you're, so if you're racist, you're bad. If you're not racist, you're good. And so it really sort of centers, that way of thinking centers very closely um, on concepts around interpersonal racism, which is really about one's private beliefs sort of manifesting, so private beliefs about race manifesting in such a way um, that it spills out and it, and it infuses the way that you interact with other people. And so that's really the sort of one-to-one -one kind of thing that happens with individuals oftentimes. Um, you know, it might be intentional, but, but not necessarily so. Um, that, that's the sort of thing where I have done a particular thing to another person or vice versa. Um, and that really is what interpersonal racism is. Um, when we think more about institutional racism, it's really more about the laws and policies and practices and procedures that, that exist within a organization that sort of perpetuate um, racism in a, in a disproportionate advantage um, for individuals who are white at the disadvantage of individuals who are people of color, black and brown folks. Um, and so that exists within institutions. So when we think about that, that might be an organization or um, a school system where there might be policies that are set up in such a way um, that leave individuals who are more marginalized um, on the negative receiving end of those policies. Um, and really, where I'd like us to really um, ground ourselves, particularly in this conversation, but more broadly as we think about how this looks for our, um, our communities that we serve, um, and thinking about how we develop interventions to really effectively make grounds on, um, on dismantling the, the system of raci racism. Um, it really is thinking about this more on a structural and systemic basis. So when I say that, what I, what I mean is that um, we live in a context where there have been historical kinds of uh, things that have happened that set us up on this particular trajectory. So when you think about uh, structural racism, it really is the history of how um, institutions, separate institutions, have sort of culminated um, and had practices that undergirded them at their, at their origins that really have set us up to kind of be on this trajectory where, um, where the the benefactors of those systems um, and the people that are receiving the services who tend to be black and brown are getting, um, are getting disadvantaged in those systems. So when we think about things like redlining um, and how that in particular has a um, deleterious effect on individuals who are poor and, and black and brown and how that is not just about the housing but how that also affects the kinds of resources that come into those communities, the kinds of schools that come into those communities, whether or not there's adequate food access in those communities. So you can kind of see how a structural system that's been created has created all of these other things around the periphery um, that really um, advantage whites um, and disadvantage um, others. So I want us to sort of think about it that way as we, as we move forward um, in our conversation. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to point out the link in the slide here that goes to racialequitytools.org and their glossary. And if you don't know about that website, have fun reading for weeks <laughs> about this work. Um, and just before we open it up, uh, just more on terms. I don't want to take the sting out of the word white supremacy, but I do want to just recognize that organizations like the KK, KKK are just one tiny manifestation of what we mean when white supremacy, which is really just the notion that white people are superior. Um, and this graphic, it may be difficult for you to read, but um, I found this on my Instagram, to be honest with you, that um, it just basically uh, uh, 
demonstrates how there are things that we all agree, at least in public discourse, okay, that's racist, that is, uh, that's what we mean by white supremacy, uh, KKK and lynching, but that is just the tip of the iceberg of so much uh, in our culture that is really built on the ideology of white supremacy. And so I'm not going to read all of these things. I encourage you to, to study this on your own time, but things like tone policing, Things like uh, expecting uh, black and indigenous people of color to teach white people. Um, if you are black and brown in this space, I'm sure that uh, in the last couple of weeks your white friends have said, hey, I don't know where to start. Can you give me some tips? That's a microaggression, and that is really rooted in the white supremacist I ideology. So again, just sort of setting the stage of what we're talking about here. Um, and then finally, um, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, I think it's safe to say, is, is uh, one of the leaders of this moment uh, and his, his books, especially How to Be an Anti-Racist that came out last year. Um, it's hard to get a copy right now <laughs> because people are turning to this literature um, and they should have been already, but here we are. Um, and so just an idea that really frames his work uh, is that there is no middle ground here. There is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. Every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity between racial groups. So there's no such thing as a non-racist uh, is, is another way of phrasing that. So now that we've set the stage, I'm going to ask Luanda to take it over again, um, and then Brandon's going to bring a poll question on the screen uh, for us to reflect on how we're feeling. Yeah, so I, I'd like to just, just open up the poll by asking folks to, to answer the question around, um, you know, recent murders of black people. And um, so, so the question is, um, recent murders of black people um, and ensuing events have taken a toll on me. I'd like people to to sort of weigh in on, on where they fall um, within these, these categories. Brandon, is the poll on the screen yet? Oh, here it comes. There we go. Give a few more seconds for folks to, to weigh in. Thank you, everybody, for answering this question. So it looks like overwhelming majority, about two-thirds of folks who answered this question are, are feeling that answers strongly agree that this, the recent murders of black people um, and the events that have come from that are having a, a negative effect on, on people. Um, thank you. Thank you for answering this question. Um, you know, at, at this juncture, I really want to open it up and either take some questions for, from folks or hear some comments from people who might want to raise their hand and speak, or any comments that might come in the, um, in the chat box. What are, what, are, what are people feeling right now? What's, what's coming up for people in this moment? I see a couple of comments here. Um, Rob, Lindsay, saying enraged. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say most, uh, many people are feeling that way. Um, mm -hmm. But also feeling happy that people are standing up for themselves right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
Libby is, is expressing feeling hopeful, um, enraged, but also hopeful that something positive has broken loose. I think many people are feeling that this particular event is the one that's causing a little bit of a shifting. Um, you know, it, I, I will say that I've experienced this as a, as a, as a black person um, in a very different way. Um, this, this seems different. Um, and that's not to say that um, it, it's, it's always a travesty when this sort of thing happens. Um, you know, I think one of the things that has been quite difficult in, in knowing about what happened uh, with George Floyd is really this idea um, of this being sort of broadcast, um, you, know, you know, on Instagram and, and Facebook and, and really everywhere um, and being inundated, I think, with those images. And also this idea that, um, you know, it's a very visceral thing, I think, um, and to know that he cried out for his mother um, in the last moment, um, you know, of his life. And being a mother, being a mother of a black son, um, you know, it's very interesting to know that, um, you know, it's a, it's a feeling that I think everybody can connect to. And I think I, I wonder to what extent that really is playing a big part in why this is such um, a moment. Um, that we all can really connect to, because I, I don't know many people who can't connect to the idea of wanting their mother and their lowest moment. Um, and to know that that's where he was, um, and even that, given that being such the desire for one's mother is such a, a, a human um, basic desire that we all can connect to, you know, the, the knowledge that, that that did not evoke um, a, a sense of humanity um, in, in this officer, I think, is, 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 is it's devastating, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, there, there are a couple of interesting comments here I want to share. Um, Barbara DePietro is, is saying she's agreeing with her, with her colleagues here um, who are questioning how long will the white attention span last on this. Um, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, to be quite honest with you, Barbara, I don't know. I, you know, I think that's a question, um, you know, to be asked of, of counterparts, right, of your counterparts. And I think there's a great opportunity for, um, for white folks to really hold one another accountable, um, you know, and keep each other engaged, um, you know, in, in, this, in this collective fight, um, you know, for justice. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, Kayla's noting that it makes me angry how people who are racist can be in a position of power. We need a change in this country. Um, she doesn't, she's apologizing for sounding harsh, um, but we need to get people with these values out of power. Um, I, don't, I, I will say, Kayla, I will validate that statement. I, I don't particularly find it to be harsh. Um, you, might, you might be judging yourself too harshly <laughs> as it relates to that. Um, but I certainly, um, I, 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 yeah, I, I would concur. It seems like many of the folks, um, your colleagues in the chat box, concur with you as well. Um, is there anyone who might want to share anything um, audio-wise? Or um, I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand, but I'm. I'm certainly seeing um, a very active chat box as it relates to this. Um, Laura's indicating that she feels very sad, but also a combination of hopeful um, and wondering whether the momentum will continue and lead to real change. Yes. I, I think that's the charge before us. I think that's the charge before us. Um, Mackenzie Colas is indicating that she agrees with one of her colleagues. Um, History is not accurately depicted or taught. Um, you know, and I think that's a really valid point. Um, as we think about this, um, there's a piece of this that we have to consider the narrative. Um, as we are um, thinking about how we engage in anti-racist work, and, and Michael will talk about this a little bit later, but it really is an idea of narrative. So I was listening to something I want to share, um, just when we think about, um, you know, Baseball, and we think about Babe Ruth, and we talk about you know him breaking the color barrier, you know, and making it to the the major leagues, and you know even that premise in itself, um, 
you know, while on the surface appears to be a really great thing and that we're giving accolades to someone who's done something really great, um, it sets up um, whiteness as, 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 as the baseline, as the goal, breaking into that system as something that all people should be aspiring to, um, which in itself is a supremacist way of thinking. Um, so I think there's absolutely a space to start to think about um, how we change the narrative even on things that we, with good intentions, um, you know, say, <laughs> right? Um, absolutely. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and, and, and turn it over um, to David, and we'll, we'll certainly continue um, to talk more ab about this. I'm going to shift the focus away from how we feel, and let's start to focus on the effect of racism on consumers, on people who are actually living on the streets, people with a lived experience of homelessness. So we have a poll question up here on your screen. Is your community witnessing an increase in laws that criminalize the experience of homelessness? So I'm going to take a moment and let you please respond to that and please answer. And if anybody doesn't know, criminalization of homelessness includes ordinances or laws that penalize sitting, sleeping, eating, panhandling, things like that. Does your city restrict panhandling? Does your city restrict sitting, sleeping in public places? Do you see a crackdown on police suites of homeless encampments? And so what I'm seeing here, we're going to take another moment or so, is I'm going to also talk about criminalization issues that are perhaps a little more subtle but equally pernicious as the outright banning of, say, sleeping in public but, but have a equivalent effect and a, and a very traumatic effect on individuals. So perhaps you may change your response for that um, looks like about a 37% or 20% of folks who believe it's the same as usual. So I'm going to take just a, one more moment here. But it looks like fully half see an increase in laws that criminalize homelessness. And perhaps a little over a third say same as usual. Okay, let's 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 move on here. Let's first want to make the point, and I want to encourage a dialogue here. That the first point I want to make is that criminalization laws are racist laws. I hope that no one has any doubt about that. African Americans, or I'll say more broadly, people of color, black people, darker skin, um, um, people of Hispanic ethnicity. Even though African Americans make up about 13% of the population, you triple that in terms of the population of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, uh, roughly across the nation, about 40% of the people experiencing homelessness um, are, are black. Here in Miami, that's even higher. It's about 60%. And as Dr. Kendi um, points out, because race is so inextricably, inextricably intertwined into everything that we do, all laws have either a negative impact on people of color or a positive impact. So therefore, criminalization of homelessness are racist. Does anyone doubt that? Laws that criminalize um, homelessness encampments, that criminalize people sleeping in public, that criminalize or restrict service of food are racist laws because they do have a negative impact on individuals um, um, who um, happen to be a darker hue than others. So looking at the chat here, I see that um, San Francisco is confused about the policy, with conflicting policies coming from various parts of government. That's a very interesting um, observation there because 
San Francisco, even though it's looked at, perceived to be an incredibly liberal place, has probably one of the most severe and worst homelessness, homelessness problems in the nation. So I can understand it's, it's conflicting and rather confused um, perspective. It's, it's confused application of laws. On the one hand, you know, there, there's certainly a, a very liberal um, perspective in terms of how they want to deal with it. On the other hand, it's the most expensive place in probably one of the most expensive places in the world to live, which is a direct cause of homelessness. So I see it ebbs and flows depending on who's at the helm. Okay, I first want to, anybody who has a doubt that criminalization is, is racist. I'd like for somebody to please, you know, let me know if you think that. I'm going to put, put out another perspective here. It's not just the overt laws that criminalize homelessness that are racist. It's also a mindset, I would say, an application of policies that actually come many times from providers, from our allies, from service, from, from providers of homelessness services that can also be unintended racist. So say, for instance, we designate a group of people as being chronically homeless. And we get very, very frustrated with this group of people because they seem to want to stay on the streets. And so we then launch into this next um, progression to say, oh, they're choosing to stay on the streets, so now we must do things to make it more uncomfortable for them. So if we serve food to them, if we let them panhandle, if we um, provide other services to them, then we're somehow enabling homelessness. Does anybody believe that on this call? Does anybody believe that people choose to be homeless and that there's a subgroup of chronically homeless that are intractable, they refuse shelter. So that's a much, much more complicated answer, but it all boils down to this. No one chooses to be homeless. I can tell you this, both from my work professionally that I do and also as my personal experience with homelessness. They may choose not to be in a shelter for various reasons, and if you've ever spent time in a shelter, you will understand that some of these reasons can be very logical reasons. But simply because someone chooses not to be in a crowded shelter that can often trigger um, um, their, their trauma does not mean that they choose to be homeless. Unfortunately, though, many of us who serve consumers will believe that we simply need to stop giving them money. We need to stop giving them food on the streets. And somehow that is going to encourage them to come in, encourage them to get housing. If we make life more uncomfortable for them, they'll somehow make them want to come in. I contend that that attitude is a racist attitude. You are not looking at the underlying trauma that in, that, that will compel someone to want to stay out of a shelter. You're not connecting with them where they're at. You're not understanding what led them to that, uh, to that point. We need to take a trauma-informed perspective. Instead of saying what is wrong with you, we need to look at a person and say what happened to you to cause this mindset. It's not just the over criminalization led by the police that's racist. It is also the more subtle view that the chronically homeless must be made more uncomfortable and must be forced inside that is also, frankly, a racist point of view. Would anybody like to um, talk about that? Uh, encourage a dialogue as to people's experiences with folks that are living on the streets because that's a very common experience or a common point of view I would say among allies among the people who 
who provide services to the folks on the streets. All right, David, I'm going to uh, enable Amanda McKinney to, to speak. She's raised her hand. Where they raised her hand. Amanda? Amanda, you, your microphone through your, through your computer should be activated now. All right, we weren't sure if this was going to work, <laughs> so that, maybe that proved it. Okay, David, we can we can move on. Okay, um, there's a very nice comment here um, um, by Rachel. I, I think there's a big difference between not choosing the resource presented and choosing to be homeless. The way to end homelessness is to have better resources and options, not to force them to accept what we have. In my opinion, bingo. That that that's exactly right. Um, the resource presented is often not a very attractive resource, and it's certainly not one um, that many people experiencing homelessness look at in terms of their best interest. And and you're right. Simply choosing not to be in a shelter. Shelters have a multitude of rules that invite noncompliance. And they're very rigid. They do not um, give space for people that do not fit rigidly within those rules. And I can tell you that the experience that I've had within shelters are that many times there's staff on the operations level by people who are formerly homeless who simply have unresolved anger issues. And they really take it out on you. They try to strip you of your dignity. They have constant assaults on your self-esteem. And so not wanting to be in a shelter can often be a very rational thing to um, uh, desire. I can tell you that. But unfortunately, and I really see that here in Miami, um, a lot of the providers that deliver services to folks believe that if you don't offer shelter, if someone refuses shelter, then they're somehow choosing to be homeless. So what can we do to um, change this mindset? I think one thing that we can do is to encourage storytelling, encourage, uh, I, I'm going around and, and hope to create an archive of two-minute videos of people who are actually living on the streets. We need to humanize the faces of homelessness. Too often, people believe that individuals who experience homeless are, are unfortunately subhuman. In fact, that's the first step in terms of decriminalization, excuse me, in terms of criminalization, is to dehumanize them, is to say that there is some strange group of people. Um, here in Miami, we have a city commissioner who believes that most of the people experiencing homelessness are from outside of the city. And so it's almost like we're being invaded by outside invaders, and so we need to protect ourselves. And so one way to evoke that mindset change, I think, is to show interviews and stories um, and, and the actual words from people experiencing homelessness to show that they are not subhuman. They're, they're just like you and me. They've, we've experienced some type of trauma, and we're in the midst of poverty, and we simply lack a home. But we're all looking for a, a livable minimum wage, and we're all looking for a roof over our heads. So I think that that um, um, let's say verdict within the court of public opinion will do a lot to humanize the faces of homelessness and to hopefully change the mindset that homeless people are not different. We're not all mentally ill, drug-addicted people. We simply want to have one great drug and sex party on the streets. All right, David, for the sake of time, I'm going to move us along. Um to our next question and another poll, uh, which Lawanda is going to uh, facilitate. So just to, to, to shift gears a little bit, we talked, um, David talked about the effect of racist policies and um, on the individuals that we serve. You know, I'd like to shift this a little bit to thinking about um, how this affects people who serve and really um, thinking about you know, does your organization have explicit policies to support staff enduring traumatization from witnessing repeated murders of black folks? And I can see people are, are jumping right in and, and answering this question. So I'll give folks a few few moments to do that.
just a couple more seconds here. So it, it looks about it looks about 85 percent of organizations do not have explicit policies in place to support staff who are witnessing um, these traumatiz you know, traumatizing events um, and murders of, of black people. Um, thank you for taking the time to answer that question. Um, you know, I think it's really important to think about the impact of um, this current moment and, and other moments that have preceded it, um, you know, with respect to the workforce. Um, you know, I know that oftentimes people talk about, and it's particularly in the social work world, I know, and I would imagine in other, other professions too, um, where we talk a lot about, you know, leaving your personal stuff at home. Um, you know, and as people who serve from the heart, um, you know, I, I tend to think that that is um, not really possible. Um, and I, I don't think advisable, to be quite honest. Um, we are people that work and have compassion, you know, and, and we bring ourselves to our work. Um, people often say that the personal is political and the political is personal, right? And I think that's very true. Um, and so it's not, it would not be surprising that people who are in the workforce, who are in positions of service to others, also are going to be feeling the effects of the things that we are witnessing in our current environment. Um, and that has a lasting impact. You know, I think Right now, we talk a lot about COVID-19 and this being a global pandemic. I would venture to say, you know, and most people talk about this and, and, and really thinking about and comparing it to um, the Spanish flu, right, that happened, what, 1918, right, and, that, and saying that that's the last pandemic that we have experienced sort of globally. Um, but I would, I would encourage you to consider racism as a pandemic. And really, it is, it is persisted well before um, COVID-19, before the Spanish flu. Um, some might even say back to 1619, right? Um, and so it's one that we have not been able to overcome, and we are still languishing in. So I really want people um, to let that resonate with you, because it is, a, it is something that um, is a, a significant public health. Um, crisis um, and pandemic that we are we are living um, right this moment. Um, you know, I think it's imperative to consider the impact of racism um, on providers who are providing care to marginalized populations. You know, we are in positions where we are helping people um, who have had really bad things happen to them, um, helping them to work through those things while we have had really bad things happen to us. Um, or have witnessed and bear witness to really bad things happening to people um, much more often than we should. Um, and so I think, um, you know, from my position and certainly thinking about it from a leadership role, it is incumbent upon us to really be thinking about how we develop uh, and support individuals and in having a workforce that is well. Um, so while I'm not surprised that, you know, we have not, um, that some agencies might not have, explicit policies that really put things into place to, to um, sort of support their staff through this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that that will be one of the things that sort of come from that. We know that toxic stress um, among folks who are doing this work, people of, people of color, people who identify as, you know, as African American, um, this produces lots of health effects, uh, negative health effects, carrying around toxic stress. So dealing with microaggressions in the workplace, um, policies that are, you know, invalidating um, experiences that we have in the workplace certainly has an impact on one's own health. We know that um, things like, um, you know, dealing with um, holding space for clients that we are hearing their experiences and not having people who we can process that with, um, having policies that don't set us up to have the kind of occupational experiences that allow us to bring our best selves to work. So that really, and, and really thinking about this across the spectrum, when we talk about from the front door to the back door, so how we look at hiring practices um, and where we look for our talent pool, how we look at promotional opportunities within and mentoring within organizations, how we look at how our boards are structured and our boards representative of the people that we're serving. Um, as well as having voice of consumers in those spaces. Um, 
you know, how we think about service provision. I, you know, David talked about this idea of um, anger, and I would, I would venture to say much of what we see in clients and also in, in staff sometimes um, is not really anger. You know, anger is one of those things that happen on a one-off. So somebody steps on my foot, I get angry. Um, somebody cut me off, or, you know, while I'm driving, I get angry. But if I'm always presenting as angry, that's really rage, right? And I think it's one of those things that bears some thought around, um, particularly as we try to engage people um, as, as providers, because one of the things that we do is when people present as angry, um, we talk about them needing anger management. But, and oftentimes those interventions fall short and they fail, to be quite honest, because we're not, we're not targeting the right thing. Um, and so we really need to be thinking about that and how we set up our staff to be best poised to have the support they need. Um, so I'm looking, I'm looking in the chat box here and wanting to, to get a sense of what other people are thinking about the kinds of support that staff might need. Um, yeah, it looks like um, Keith is saying that he agrees that racism is a pandemic. People around the world are in solidarity against racism in America. And they're also sharing their experiences of racism within their own countries. Absolutely. It is a global phenomenon. Um, we, we, we've done it well here in America. Um, so Libby is noting that being also a harm reduction agency, above all things, the National Working Group, um, they believe that we should have a statement of um, policy. Um, I need time to be very thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. As Barbara's noting that we would welcome suggestions for any anti-racist health care uh, advocacy agenda and what that might include. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Jacob is noting that he agrees with David. Um, it is the identification of citizens. Um, as the enemy that needs to be pacified um, when we look at um, these current policies. Um, reparations, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so Brittany is asking, how do we think the policies can shift and be changed within organizations? Um, which steps should be taken? Um, you know, I, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we can start to do. I think one of the biggest things that we've always done um, that I think we need to stop doing um, is deciding for people. Um, I think we need to ask people, and I think we need to really engage people in meaningful conversations um, because I think that's part of the issue is that we think we know what people need, um, but we sometimes, and when I say we, I mean like the global we. Um, you know, we make decisions about what we think those people need, or what we think those people should be doing. Um, but I think it's very far and few between sometimes that we actually say, what would make you feel supported in this work? What would feel like um, that I am hearing you in this work? And so I think that's the place to start, to really have participatory processes um, at, the very, at the very forefront. And I think, you know, making sure that we do that in every aspect of this work. Um, and not in the way that we have, um, you know, with respect to, you know, saying, okay, we need, you know, a consumer on the board and that person, you know, holds a seat and we say, you know, check, we did that part. Okay, check. No, but really <laughs> listening to the experiences that people bring. Um, and I think having consumers and I think having staff and I think having staff who are on the front lines. So I think any coalition or any momentum that happens with a room full of executives with no representation from direct staff providers um, will always fall short, will always fall short. So I would say that's a place to start um, by making sure that those spaces are really inclusive of the people that we serve, representative of the staff um, within agencies, and making sure that those, that those spaces um, where the decision decisions are happening are inclusive of both those things. Yes, David mentioned putting people with lived experiences of homelessness on your gover governing board. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, 
So Rachel stating one thing would be trauma-informed medical facilities. People of color are rightfully distrustful of medical systems. Um, putting publicly owned trauma-informed medical care in the right neighborhoods, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, and I think these are the things that our staff see and work with every day. Um, and I think just as much as we are working with our clients, we need to be really intentional about making sure that staff have what they need and are well supported. Because again, um, if we are wanting to help improve outcomes for those that we serve, and we say that we are committed um, and we are mission driven, then we also have to be thinking about the fact that staff have to be well. You can't have an unwell workforce, and whether that be physically because of toxic stress, you know, if all of your staff are dealing with hypertension and diabetes and all the things that we know disproportionately affect people of color um, and have really close connections, um, if associations, if not causation, from uh, toxic stress, and high cortisol levels and everything else that's coursing through people's bodies when they're constantly um, in a state of, um, of unrest and stress, um, then we talk about that being a manifestation of, of mental health challenges and stresses and emotional difficulties among the workforce. And then you have that workforce working with people um, who are also dealing with those things. And we know that the biggest predictor of client outcomes is not whatever they're you know, therapy you're, you're um, dictating or whatever medication you're giving, but it's really the, the provider's belief that the client can do well and be well. And your belief is going to stem from your belief for your own self, right? And so we have to be, we have to be well um, as providers. And, and, and people need the support to be able to do that. Um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to David. Oh, this one's nice. Um, Brandon, can you bring up our last poll, please? So we've got about um, eight minutes left, um, and I want to give you a heads up that before uh, we conclude, we're going to ask for your book and podcast recommendations. So start, uh, get that ready. I don't want you to do it yet to, to distract from the poll, but right now, uh, please take a second to respond to this. Has your organization made a public commitment to racial justice? And your options are yes, no, or ish. <laughs> a statement, not necessarily a commitment. I get a lot of your emails, uh, our member organization's emails, um, and I know that many of you have made statements uh, in your newsletters in solidarity with Black Lives Matter or um, maybe no more nuanced uh, statements. but. Is that really a commitment? Just give another couple of seconds here. So um, I, I think everybody can see it on the screen, but um, more than half of you have said yes. Uh, unequivocally, you made a public commitment to racial justice. Um, almost 8% said no, and then there's more nuance for everybody else. So I encourage you to share in the chat uh, what you feel like the, um, your, your organization's commitment actually looks like. As you're typing, I just want to um, reflect on uh, the council's um, learning collaboratives. Um, and we call them diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm getting less and less happy with that term because it sounds so corporate um, and, and vanilla sometimes. Um, and as all of you know, doing work that is publicly funded, you have to be, you have to use code words like health equity sometimes. But what we really are talking about is um, institutionalizing anti-racism in our organizations. Um, and I, I don't know how controversial a concept this is to you, but we've been talking about anti-racism for 55 minutes here. Um, but really, I believe that the, um, the work of dismantling racism is, in fact, to institutionalize anti-racism. Um, and I know that that is maybe a catchy phrase that doesn't have a lot of uh, specificity. So I'm encouraging folks to, to share what they feel like that means and where we need to move forward. Uh, within our organizations. Uh, 
and also share that we are going to be um, typing up our lessons learned from our two learning collaboratives, uh, that are, it, the second of which is concluding next week. Um, and we'll be really excited to, to hopefully produce something for the field that is meaningful and not just a document, um, something that can be really insightful in your work on anti-racism. So I see some folks typing. So I just want to reflect on some of the comments here. Darlene is saying people have to be brave enough to feel uncomfortable. Too often they don't push themselves to face issues because they don't want to feel comfortable or face the fact or feel uncomfortable. Um, they don't want to face the fact that the system and the organization needs to change. I think that's absolutely right. Um, this work is necessarily uncomfortable. Um, and as, as I said at the beginning, uh, for different reasons if you're white or a person of color, but um, discomfort is part of this work and we really just need to lean into that and get used to it. So I'm not seeing a ton of engagement in, uh, on this one, so let's um, just briefly turn to some recommendations. Um, I told you we would barely scratch the surface uh, on this last point here, but um, this uh, image uh, is another thing that I found on Instagram that is uh, a really uh, lovely way to depict some of the, the leading um, authors uh, and their material uh, in one little picture here. So just call out some of the ones uh, that I'm personally uh, familiar with. New Jim Crow is certainly seminal, How to Be an Anti-Racist, So You Want to Talk About Race, um, Just Mercy, Michael Eric Dyson's uh, Tears We Cannot Stop. Um, so I know that that's, a lot of this is difficult to read, but you'll get the slides and then you can, um, and then you can explore further. So encouraging you guys to uh, add your own podcast and book recommendations into the chat real quick before we move forward. And I try not to uh, promote podcasts that I don't actually listen to, so I just put the ones that I listen to on the slide here, but I know that there are a lot of others uh, that exist in the world. I'd be curious to hear from you all about um, what materials um, that you're using in your personal anti-racism practice uh, to educate yourself. And I also want to call attention to the resource pod here up to the left of the, uh, the chat box. Um, a local um, theater, a nonprofit theater here in Nashville, has created this uh, list of uh, films created by black filmmakers that are now free to watch, uh, at least for the moment we find ourselves in, however that, that lasts. Um, you can click on that and download the, the list there, and I encourage you to do so. And just while people are continuing to make recommendations, I um, want to point you to uh, a web page on our website um, with anti-racism resources. This is principally the culmination of the learning collaboratives that I have alluded to, and it's certainly not exhaustive, and I uh, want to continue to add to it. Um, as we grow, this work is, is never finished. And so as we evolve as a community together, we'll continue to evolve our thinking and our resources. So people are suggesting Color of Law and Evicted, certainly incredible works in this space. Not seeing any podcasts uh, recommended here. Oh. In Search of Black Power was suggested by Judith. Thank you. We lost Lawanda's feed but I believe that she can still hear us. Um, they Can't Kill Us All by Wesley Lowry, Killing the Black Body by Dorothy Roberts. Yeah, I've read that one. And so as you guys continue to type and we draw to a close, um, I just want to thank you for bringing your whole selves to this conversation. Um, we know that this is a, a moment of trauma that we are experiencing together. Uh, but what I love about healthcare for the homeless is that we are bound to each other in love and solidarity. Um, so we will move forward. This conversation didn't solve anything, and that's not the point. Um, but we are recommitting as the council uh, to racial justice, and I hope that all of you are too. So I want to thank Lawanda and David for being co-facilitators today. Um, we really love you and appreciate you. Um, and I guess that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.